Have you checked the children? <laughs> Long days and pleasant nights, fellow travelers, along the path of the beam. I am known on this level of the tower as Jaime and Fuego, and if it please you, join me here for a bit of palaver on hail to Stephen King. That is Reezy, everybody, and obviously Bemeninos, and welcome to the horror show. And this is one that I had been kind of plotting out for a significant amount of time because I feel like this film is just misunderstood and unnecessarily hated upon. And it is celebrating its 20th anniversary as of just this past weekend. And that is none other than, as I jump to the front of the notes, The Lawnmower Man. Yeah, so the 1992 film that was released on March 6th is the one that just uh, celebrated its anniversary. But goodness, I can't even believe it has been, you know, 20 years, excuse me, 30 years, goodness lord, since this film came out. That definitely ages me, makes me feel old, and I distinctively remember the ad marketing campaign because of the fact that when they were doing the TV spots and stuff like that, they proclaimed it as Stephen King's The Lawnmower Man. And that's one of the strangest aspects, like, besides the film in and of itself and the fact that I do actually like it and it's not like a forgot the face of uh, their father sort of situation or anything of that nature, but this is one that King, for whatever reason, did not like the usage of his name regarding this and... Yeah, based on a short story, I believe it was May of 1975 in Cavalier, was where the, the original short story was done, and then it was, uh, what, recollected for Night Shift, and then there was the Marvel Comics adaptation in the early 80s, and yet, yes, I, I will admit, it does not really resemble very much, aside from the fact that there is a lawnmower that is running by itself, and, you know, somebody gets killed at one point in the, you know, film and ends up in, like, the, you know, bird feeder area, like, little moat, whatever the hell you want to call it. And, uh, but as aside from that, yes, it is very much expanding upon ideas, building, and doing its own thing, but how many different Psy King tales have done that, especially all of those direct-to-video bits? You know, Children of the Corn was very much right about to get roaring again with The Final Sacrifice and all of the direct-to-VOD stuff that would hit in the 90s. So I don't understand really why this film struck such a nerve with Psy King to actually sue New Line Cinema and the people behind this movie and get them to remove his name. It's one of the most like peculiar sort of situations when it comes to the use of King's name and how so many others have utilized it, bastardized it per se, and yet for whatever reason this one rubbed him the wrong way and it it's a pretty good movie. It's got some very decent ideas especially. Now granted the CGI has not really aged very well, but it has a certain charm for somebody who grew up like me in that particular era in you know late 80s, early 90s and everything, and so I I can appreciate it, I can like the throwback aspect of it, but yeah, King was newly sober and decided he had an axe to grind with this movie, and I do wonder if he ever actually watched it or if it was just like his team of people around him that was like, nah, get your name off that shit. Because in this movie they mentioned that like the shop is a integral part of the storytelling here. They are the ones behind the uh, virtual space industries. They're like the, the funders, you know, that are actually doing this, uh, or at least, you know, putting all the money together so that Pierce Brosnan's character can do all of these studies and experiments and everything, and they're trying to build a more powerful, like, warrior, I suppose. And they're starting with chimps, but eventually they do want to move on to people, which is what eventually does happen with the character of Jeff Fahey? I... Hey, I, I don't know how to properly pronounce the name, and so, you know, uh, excuse me if I'm butchering it, but that dude was in a lot of stuff in the 80s and 90s. I know he was on Miami Vice, I know he did a few other things, but, like, he was more so notable for theatrical stuff for me. So he did Body Parts, which was this uh, uh, taking limbs of serial killers kind of craziness that came out in 1991. And I'm just going to consult the notes really quick because, yeah, he also did some stuff like Psycho 3 and the third Darkman movie. And then he's still working today. I mean, he was in Machete. He was in Planet Terror. I know he's a buddy of Robert Rodriguez. He looks completely different now. He's not going for that baby face look. He's like rocking the beard and just looks much more sinister, but 
He's kind of a sympathetic character in this movie because he's a very obviously mentally handicapped guy who is living in this little shack shed and he's he's being looked after by this religious, uh, well, yeah, a priest obviously, but very religious-centric priest, like not a caring, compassionate, very much focusing upon the using religion as a weapon and more so for just abuse. And at one point that character even mentions molestation and I'm like, as I was re-watching this, I'm like, this is 1992? I didn't even know if some of that stuff had come out. Maybe it was just like little whisperings and whatnot, but yeah, so uh, Jeff Fahey's character as Job, who is mentioned at one particular time as, uh, oh, I'm trying to find the line, uh, brings the wrath of the Lord on himself just like his namesake. That's what uh, that re overbearing religious guy does to him at one particular point. And he's like flogging him and whipping him and abusing him and all that nastiness. This, you know, poor handicapped guy. It's, it's really messed up. And then you have Pierce Brosnan playing a guy who is, you know, behind all of this research, and you think he's gonna be a bad guy initially, but he does have personal conviction, and he's not trying to overdo it, and really, the nefarious nastiness is coming from the shop, and some familiar sidekick casting, at least for people who have watched newer stuff, a uh, dude named Dean Norris, who, he's the director of the shop in this particular film, but he plays Big Jim on the CBS television adaptation of Under the Dome, and uh, probably more so than anything, people know him from that he did a lot of feature stuff like Lethal Weapon 2 and various action movies and, and whatnot, but I know he's big in, uh, you know, uh, Breaking Bad and he's an important, you know, bit of nastiness in that, and since I have not watched past the first season, then that was a long ass time ago at this particular point, don't really have much to say, but, you know, seeing his familiar face in this adaptation that despite being scapegoated and uh, disowned by Cy King, it's still a it's a different level of the tower. It is still very much a Stephen King themed thing and uh, yeah, I I just don't understand the scorn, honestly. Especially with the fact that it starts out with a very ambitious proclamation like right when the movie starts before we even see any people or action or anything going down. And it's about the fact that virtual reality is going to become this huge thing and uh, even later in uh, in the film in the third act it mentions that by 2001 that uh, Job's character is going to be connected into just about everything if he can make his way into this primary mainframe or something this is when this tech was still relatively new and so there was still a lot of science fiction as opposed to you know like technological factual going down in this and but yet for that reason I appreciate the fact that they dreamt big and that they were really just kind of foreseeing the the future and everything and uh, at least to a minor degree I mean I know VR has come back you know kind of and I, I remember specifically Cecil playing the VR Resident Evil game Resident Evil 7 if I remember correctly and so it's kind of been an ebb and flow as opposed to wanting to be in the midst of the total immersion that this film really deals with because really we know what's happened with the dawn of the internet age and the connectivity there so I think more so it was the visualization that didn't necessarily pan out the way this movie kind of predicted but the connectivity most definitely as it just expanded exponentially as we all know as we're on our little mini computer phones and everything on a daily basis and so this is an ambitious movie it, and yes it has its fair share of flaws as I mentioned the CG has not aged very well and there is a lot of silliness it's it's very much an R-rated horror movie that probably has its DNA more so in the mid to late 80s than the 1992 uh, you know March when it actually came out especially with like some of the silly sex stuff that you get in this so Jeff Fahey's character is taken in by Pierce Brosnan to be his first human subject after Pierce's character is, he's drinking, smoking like crazy, smoking in the bed, and his wife complains about that, and I'm just like, Jesus, people smoke in the bed? Like, uh, in any event, uh, it's a you know, different time, different place and everything, but, so, his lady leaves him, and uh, he's down and out and frustrated, especially after his initial chimp uh, that was helping with this, what, Project 5 or Prospect 5, whatever they were calling it. Uh, so uh, his subject has gone mad and is dead and everything and, you know, killed some other people from the shop in the process. And so he very nonchalantly asked Jeff Fahey's Job character, he's like, hey, come over and play some video games with the kid from Last Action Hero. And I, I was just scratching my head. I'm like, 
Was he Prehysteria, which is the dinosaur movie from the early 90s or Last Action Hero? Too. He was in both, and so he's a little bit younger in this, but he does have, uh, his name's Peter in this, but Peter and Job have really great chemistry because, you know, Job's character has, and he's very obviously a little bit mentally disabled, like, but to a very mild sort of degree. And uh, so he plays some VR games that just take me back to the the chips they were using for like Star Fox in, uh, in Super Nintendo games in the early 90s. And there was a Super Nintendo game of The Lawnmower Man, which was kind of fun to, to remember. But so, yeah, Job is kind of being eased into it by Pierce Brosnan's character. And so after playing some games with Peter, the kid from next door, who has this insanely abusive father, which is a very weird subplot, but it just sets up for what happens with him and Big Red, the lawnmower that is used by Job without actually moving it. So there are, you know, nods to the original short story in that regard, but, you know, Peter's father just wants to drink beer and watch pro wrestling. And hey, I can kind of <laughs> agree with that sentiment, but he is very stereotypical, abusive father, like, why'd you leave the bike out, and, you know, where I have to park my car, and he's like grabbing him by the neck and just being a total piece of shit. So that's a subplot for Peter that just gives some justification to, so when, when Job does finally, without getting super spoilery, he goes through the training with, uh, you know, a pre-Golden Eye Pierce Brosnan, but once the power starts to get to his head and his brain's mainframe has been a little bit overloaded and he does start getting all these powers and he does start doing some things that are harmful to people. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it just kind of gives some justification and it, because the people he's killing aren't the most savory of characters, you know, they are bad for sure. And so the setup with, you know, uh, the, the neighbor's father and a few other things and uh, what happens to the, the priest who is abusive as well. And so, yeah, it's, it's very much a comeuppance sort of situation in this regard once Job is kind of pushed over the edge. But, I mean, props to Jeff Fahey and the fact that he does have an arc in this. He starts out as such a simpleton and then as he's going through this training and gets to the actual VR, not like the racing, gaming, uh, what the falling, floating, flying sort of stuff that Pierce is doing initially, once it gets to the really advanced nitty gritty of it, it, he starts just gaining intelligence that he did not possess previously. And that's where you see he, he kind of adopts this like Western sort of look and you know, with the jeans and you know, the belt and whatever. And it's, it's in one of the more amusing bits that I alluded to a little bit earlier in the fact that yeah, he gets, uh, gets down to sexy time <laughs> with this widowed neighbor who is eyeing him a couple points where he's like mowing the lawn and everything and she's like, come up for lemonade and it becomes much more than lemonade, although that's a joke that was in, uh, what, uh, Grand Theft Auto, <laughs> if I remember correctly? But as, as he's going through this transformation into being more studly and everything, he meets the, uh, you know, widowed woman at the gas station, and, you know, she's like, well, looking forward to having you mow my lawn. <laughs> you just can't help but laugh out loud at some of that cheese factor which is present in this movie. So, yes, it is very much like there's a lot of moving pieces, and they don't always coordinate and collaborate as much as you would like, but once again, back to that, that big A word, the ambitiousness of this movie, and, you know, props in that regard, I, I must say, it, it never really, I mean, the sex and a couple F-bombs, sure, is what warrants the R rating, but I, I don't know if, like, anything on the level of violence, there is, there is a bit where a dude's, uh, you know, rifle is, like, inadvertently, like, he doesn't have control of it anymore, and so he pulls it around and he blows, you know, a hole through his forehead, but I, I, all of the other violence is, like, the, like weird particle disintegration as, as Job starts to, you know, get these abilities, which I was re-watching and I was distinctively remembering when I had eaten some Locos Hongos, some, uh, some psychedelic, you know, getting psychedelicized, as Mr. Jim Morrison said, but, yeah, mushrooms of a uh, specific variety, and I watched this, and I remembered lifting some specific moments of discussion, some dialogue from this movie, and still one of my personal favorites, even though it is harkening back to uh, a bit in the dead zone, where when Johnny Smith is just realizing the extent of these powers that he's tapping into, you know, this foresight and a few other things, he, he never really achieved specifically what Job gets to, with like, you know, levitating inanimate objects and, uh, you know, jumping into people's minds and, like, Deanna Troying that shit, being able to read their thoughts and whatnot, but, um, 
Nonetheless, the doctor who was examining Johnny Smith in the Cronenberg movie, and I think it's a line of dialogue in the original King book as well, but where he's talking about you're either in possession of a very new human ability or a very old one. And this movie takes that bit of dialogue and expands it in an essence of eloquence, which I appreciate. And so I did actually jot down the entirety of it because I like it so much. It's where Job is talking to uh, Pierce Brosnan's scientist character. And he says, I realize nothing we've been doing has been new. We haven't been tapping into new areas of the brain. We've just been awakening the most ancient. This technology is simply a route to powers that conjurers and alchemists used centuries ago. The human race has lost that knowledge, but through the power of virtual reality, I'm bringing it back. And that's where Pierce Brosnan, who becomes you know, the hero of the story as Job is falling more into this cyber god complex, cyber god being the original title of this script before it was retrofitted with the optioning of the King you know, IP and everything. And that's where he's like, no, like the first aspects of where somebody is just becoming wrought in the delusions of grandeur is where the Christ complex comes into play. And because he's becoming this like cyber Christ where he's going to be this savior and he's going to put himself out into that major mainframe that I mentioned and be, you know, part of thousands. And this is the early 90s, remember? So, you know, thousands of areas where he could just impose his will and his control and everything. Once again, man, there's cool ideas in this movie, and the, the fact that, yes, it is so much of its era in how things actually transpired as far as tech advancements and stuff like that, but I still, I, I have to give credit to, you know, to this movie, and the director who I thought I jotted down his name, but I realized that I, uh, you know, neglected to, he went on to do a couple other, like, kind of tech stuff, like Virtuosity a few years later, which is a very underrated early 90, early to mid 90s action, or with some tech aspects as well, and so, um, Obviously, dude had an affinity for it, and, you know, props in that regard. Uh, trying to see if there's any, yes, the, the big red lawnmower scene, the fact that it's off camera does kind of irritate me a little bit, and then the fact that all of those other deaths, with the exception of the aforementioned rifle shot, are, you know, the, the usage of this very early CGI. We were a year or so removed from Terminator 2, and so they wanted to show that you know, not everything had to be practical on screen, but... Yeah, it does look a little bit silly, the uh, being engulfed by flames bit, and even more so where Job is trying to infiltrate the, the, the shop, like, kind of headquarter area and put himself into that major mainframe, and he has this fleet of insects, like wasps or something, and so it, it just looks like almost like a big sea of particle fire sort of thing, and then there are some close-ups as there's all of these military soldiers that are there trying to hold off this invasion, and... They look bad, man. They they really do not. Uh, it's not aged well, once again. But, you know, at the end of the day, I really wanted to revisit this film because of the fact that I did appreciate a lot of those aspirations, a lot of those ideas. And the fact that, yeah, it does definitely feel like something released in the early 90s. It still is a pretty cool movie. And for that reason, I know that there is also a director's cut, which was uh, just reminded to my attention as I... I, I had filmed this already, and then I wanted to, you know, refilm and rewatch the director's cut and everything. So I don't know if I will eventually do a like separate, specific look at that, or if I can maybe just combine some of those thoughts into the sequel, which I will have to do at some particular point. I have to do. It was originally called Beyond Cyberspace when it was coming into theaters, and then retitled as Job's War. I know like pretty much nobody returned for that movie from the original cast and um, yeah, kind of a bummer. Although if I remember correctly, dude who played Trash Can Man in uh, what uh, the, the Stand obviously, the 1994 miniseries is maybe the lead or the villain or he takes over to play Job, I can't recall. But so Job's War, Beyond Cyberspace, whatever you want to call the second Lawnmower Man movie. This one made enough money you know, maybe initially based on the King name, even once he, you know, struck it from the record and everything, and New Line did still use it in the, the home video release, which pissed King off even more, and I think he sued them again, or, you know, they just had to give more royalties or something, but, you know, uh, it made money. It did. It was only a $10 million picture, and the box office gross was like 
32.5 million just in the United States alone. And I know it was released overseas in Japan, it got a different title, and a few other regions as well. So it was, it made money. You know, it stacked that Skrilla. And so that's why we did get a sequel uh, based on how they end it with a potential escape of a character. Uh, I really want to watch the director's cut now because it adds like 40 more minutes to this movie. It's like 220 and change. And this one, the, the theatrical version is like, what, 148, so just a little over 100 minutes. But it obviously adds a lot more. I'm not sure if that is good or bad, but, you know, the fact that the director's cut is rentable for I think like $2.99 on Amazon and Vudu and your typical destinations for stuff like that. So I have to get on that train. I have to check it out, see how much expansion, see how much for better or for worse, because, you know, just because something is a director's cut and, you know, makes things bloated, it's not always going to be the, you know, like Cameron's Aliens or even Zack Snyder's Batman v Superman, you know, ultimate cut. So it, it doesn't always make a film better when you have things that are extended. But in this case, based on all of those aforementioned ideas that I dig so much about this film and what they were trying to say, what they were trying to predict, I do have to check out the director's cut, that, that DC going down. But um, yeah, the technology peeled back a layer to reveal another universe. Like, there's really interesting bits of dialogue throughout this movie. And so, yeah, despite the fact that a lot of the CG in the third act was awful looking, but I do appreciate the idea that the film ends on as well. And it's something that Pierce Brosnan's character had said, where um, embracing the wisdom instead of the ignorance, that, you know, this tech has the possibility to free the mind of man as opposed to enslaving it. And so, once again, Deep stuff, you know, and it it's not a great movie. I will not go as far as proclaiming it to be such, but it's a very interesting movie, you know, especially for the time where tech was really about to hit some major, major advancements with, you know, the onset of the internet and various other things. And the fact that, yeah, virtual reality did not become this in every single household sort of situation. I wish I had one, you know. Uh, it's still relatively pricey. I know there's... Uh, there's what, Oculus, and then there's another one. In, in any event, inconsequential, we've done some VR playthroughs here on the horror show, and it's not in every single person's home. Like, even a few years later, I was just rewatching Batman Forever, and uh, just VR, I, I think, just, I don't know, probably because it's, it's pricey, uh, and still is, even to this day. But, you know, beyond that, uh, it's, it's a very intriguing snapshot of where people were thinking stuff was going to go with all of the technological advancements that were hitting so hard at this particular point. So, once again, that is my thoughts on The Lawnmower Man, and I still will contend, despite the lawsuit, Stephen King's The Lawnmower Man, and uh, yeah, I'll probably go back and do Job's War slash uh, Beyond Cyberspace at some particular point. But uh, uh, thank you for all who bared with my scratchy voice today. Allergies have been just a mofo as the seasons are changing and all the pollen in the air and whatnot. But uh, still, got through this sucker. So, accent the grande gracias. I've been Jaime Fuego. You can find moi on all social media sectors, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, here on the YouTubies. And I just wanted to show off this uh, awesome little pop that I got recently. It is a dead version of Gage and Church. Uh, shout out to Ray Kelly, I believe, is the one who clued me into this. That is the newest uh, addition to the collection that's going to probably uh, supplant the version of Gage and Church that is back there. But I've been Jaime Fuego, all social media sectors, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, as I already mentioned. Double down. Why the hell not? And uh, yes, next week is going to be our off week where I'm going to be diving back into Bakker at the Moon. Ha ha ha! with the third Book of Blood. So yes, there will not be a new Hail to Stephen King next week, but um, yes, very much looking forward to going through some more of those short stories from Clive. They are terrific. And also a reminder about Book of the Month for here in March is none other than Everything's Eventual, Psy King's collection of short stories that just also celebrated a 20th anniversary. So not 30 years like, you know, Lawnmower Man, but still one that I'm very much looking forward to getting reacquainted with. Lots of gems in there. And uh, yeah, so if you feel inclined, check that out. The first Tuesday of April is when we will be discussing that live here on The Horror Show. And uh, yeah, some uh, fresh reviews, uh, about, well, the review of Fresh, which is coming. Great film that uh, stars Sebastian Stan that is on Hulu currently. Myself and Cecil are going to tape a review of that. We did a spoilers discussion about the Batman, uh, a great uh, trailer reaction roundup. So lots of fun stuff to check out here. And uh, we greatly appreciate the liking, sharing, subscribing. You know the drill. So I've been Fuego, y'all have been Rad Status. And until the Wheel of Ka comes around once more, hasta luego, sin amigos, constant readers and viewers alike. Say thank you. Hoping 
we have been well met and that we share more of this palaver sooner rather than later. And until then, remember to stay scared and obviously read Stephen King. If you haven't read the short story uh, of Lawnmower Man, it's, it's interesting, but dare I say in some ways, I actually prefer this wacky predictive feature film.